All right. Hi, folks. Doc here. I am here in Pensacola, Florida with my good buddy Randy here, who's my host for this little vacation. Randy, I can't thank you enough, man. You've just really, really made this... Not a, not a problem there, Doc. ...an incredible trip. Awesome. Randy, uh, if you're a member of the Sprockets Garage Facebook group, is an administrator on the team and our resident rotary engine nut. Uh, so we're going to take a few minutes here tonight for Randy just to go over some rotary basics and show us some engine parts and give us a little rundown on how they work. Okay, Randy, show us what you've got here. All right, guys. You first got to forgive us. We're dealing with the humidity here, which most of y'all are probably totally cool with, have the same things going on. We have the fans off simply so that you can hear what's going on here. But we're going to do the best we can, drip and sweat, pour and sweat, whatever, here in this lovely Florida weather. Don't get your sweat on my sweat. Same. A sweat on sweat action is the best. Oh, dude. This is the best. All right, so basically what we have here is I'm going to start out with some of the basic components of the rotary engine. One thing that we're missing here is the eccentric shaft. Unfortunately, I do not have one of those on hand. That's a good distance away from us. Chris and I talked about the situation. But if you can imagine in your mind somewhat of a crankshaft um, crossed over with a camshaft, that is the idea you can look up eccentric shafts, you know, get more details on them. Um, basically, what we're looking at here is what's called the front iron. Front iron houses the water pump. Um, the eccentric cat shaft comes through the, the front of it, basically is your main drive pulley uh, for your water pump and um, for your power steering if you had it on this particular model. This is a, this is a 12A 1.1 liter uh, Wankel rotary engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this around here. You know, as you can tell, this is disassembled. There's no water pump, there's no exhaust, so on and so forth. As we turn this around, you'll notice that there's a planetary gear. The rotor here is going to ride around the planetary gear, and I'll demonstrate that here in just a few. One thing I want to point out, um, everybody's very familiar with um, cams and valves. The rotary engine lacks that, and simply because of the design and the port. This is an intake port, simply pulling from the intake manifold, which bolts up directly here. These ports can be played with in many different ways, sizes, shapes, so on and so forth. Anything from the stock port that Mazda had put into these all the way up to what we call a peripheral port. Peripheral port's getting way off into the distance on things. I don't want to confuse y'all, so we're going to stick to the basics. So if I can interrupt for just a second here, this doesn't have any conventional four-stroke engine type valves. This is much more like a piston-ported two-stroke in terms of valving. Correct? Very much so. What we in the rotary world call it is our four-stroke two-stroke simply because you put oil in, the engine and the designers have incorporated such a manner as to put uh, oil to the fuel. Uh, we do not mix it, hypothetically, by uh, factory specs, we do not mix it like you would a two-stroke. But I'll get more into the pre-mixing into gas and fuel. So, lack of valves, you have the rotor not only acts as a piston inside the rotary engine, but it also acts as your valve system intake, controlling intake and exhaust. So simply what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the um, rotary housing here, or the rotor housing here, the rotor travels inside this housing. You will notice this has a peripheral exhaust port. Basically this is your exit where your exhaust manifold and flange would bolt up. And this is uh, basically where your air would exit from. Alright, so simply what I'm going to do is take the rotor housing here I'm going to attach it to the front iron. Um, as you will notice, there is a peripheral exhaust port. Um, this variation has changed recently with Mazda and uh, what's known as the Mazda RX-8 and the 13B Renesis motor. Um, like I said, I'll come back to that. I'll get you more involved in it. You will notice that there are two spark plugs per rotor. Um, same concepts, two spark plugs per piston. One is a primary burn and one is a secondary burn. Uh, the characteristics of the motor are very different than that of your piston engine in multiple ways but if I simply connect these two here together for demonstration purposes I can enter and take the rotor you will notice that on the rotor there's a gear for riding the planetary gear this rotor simply rides the planetary gear that is in place on the iron allowing it to travel in motion and ultimately exert force on the eccentric shaft uh, in turn putting out torque and horsepower so anyway, we are going to follow this side. As you will notice, as the rotor travels in a motion, we're looking at this backwards, uh, the rotor will come along to the exhaust port, will push out, comes back around along to the intake side, pulls air in 
via suction, sealed process, comes around and turn, compresses, combust, follows the motion around and comes into the exhaust port again. So this is a constant cycle in which the rotor never changes directions, it's constantly spinning in, a, in the same direction at all times. So many of you have seen the, um, the process of the rotary engine. I know I have posted several little video clips, uh, animated video clips, so on and so forth. Aside from this, a lot of you know the basic uh, idea that the rotary engine is not the most reliable in the world. And everybody says apex seals, apex seals, apex seals. This is where we get into pre-mixing. So as I pull this rotor, you'll notice that the rotor has three apexes on it. The main components of the rotor would be the apex seal, the corner seal, the um, side seals, and then the oil control rings. So here I have your oil control rings. Oil control rings simply sit in around the um, eccentric or the uh, planetary hub on the rotor that keeps oil inside and the lubricated parts. Now, how you ask how oil gets to the outside? The oil pump actually has a oil metering pump to the outside that takes oil to the top end of the engine and allows it to premix with gas. The apex seals with a apex seal spring. I would simply place the apex seal spring into position. I would take the apex seal, set it down on top, completing more or less the rings of a rotary engine. That would happen on all three sides. So, going into the apex seals and the longevity of apex seals, Mazda originally called for the simple fact that you could change your oil every 3,000 miles what, by adding a quart every 1,500 miles. What us rotary nuts got into is we started finding that apex seals were only good for approximately uh, 100,000 miles on a well taken care of, uh, well oiled engine. At the 100,000 mile mark, things started to become a little sketchy. It was a situation of, you know, can I take this across country or am I going to have to rebuild it in the next 15 miles? So what we came up with is the pre-mix design. Pre-mixing allows us to put oil into our gas tank. I personally pre-mix uh, 8 ounces to 15 gallons of gas. What that does is on startup, when the rotor is sitting simply inside the housing, it sits overnight in a fashion like so. This would be the front of the engine here. This would be the rear of the engine all of your oil eventually leaks down past the apex seal, settles in the bottom, then what you have is you have three dry apex seals and a dry housing. So putting fuel in, even on a carbureted motor, you can simply pump the gas pedal, you pump gas into the chamber, that's also taking oil and lubrication, you put oil and lubrication into it upon startup, you have a simple and you have a clean startup with a lot less apex seal wear. Also today, we have uh, apex seals made of many different combinations of materials. Uh, we have what we call the cryo apex seals. There's many companies out there that make them and are making uh, a lot more longevity out of the apex seals. As we zoom in here, you also know this is a corner seal that goes into the rotor. The corner seal essentially holds a small bit never goes right on camera. No, certainly not. <laughs> as holding the side seal. The side seal is kind of set in place here. Unfortunately, it's a little hard to pull out. We're film filming, we're on camera, so on and so forth. It's probably best done with a pick. <laughs> best done with a pick, exactly. But the side seals here um, also act in maintaining compression inside the combustion chamber. Um, you will notice that the combustion chamber is on the side of the rotor. These vary in three different phases. You have the Mazda standard, you have a high compression, and you have a low compression. Low compression was uh, meant for the turbo models. Uh, high compression is an aftermarket phase in which the high compression allows you to run a naturally aspirated high compression engine. With that said, Mazda's claim to fame in the rotary engine with the right apex seal combination. Simply uh, put, the 3mm apex seals that came factory on the 12A rotary 
are three millimeters wide. The three millimeter apex seals were stronger than that of the uh, predecessor we're going down to a two meter apex two millimeter apex seal. You can apply boost and as long as you can apply boost and you apply fuel um, with the simple changing out of the planetary gear and the, uh, the gear inside the rotor that it rides on to keep you from spinning a rotor you can spin these things up to uh, almost eleven and a half thousand RPMs simply. It's about air, fuel, and uh, spark. How fast and how adequately you can do it. So, so what is the stock without changing seals, without changing rotors, without changing that, what is the stock typical red line on these things? Now when you lit your car up for me yesterday, your tack went you buried it at eight. Okay. And it's buried it like at eight thousand RPMs. Mazda's recommended uh, RPM range is that eight thousand RPM range. In the rotary world, all of us always have something to say uh, that a red line a day keeps the mechanic away. So what that means is getting that red line is um, once the engine is pre-worn, taking it to red line is lubricating everything. It's clearing out the combustion chambers, clearing out carbon, uh, making sure everything's moving in motion, there's no hang-ups, stick-ups, so on and so forth. If you do that every day, it's great. If you let a rotary sit for a while, for a time, especially carbureted with the, the gas that we have now, as you know, in the uh, small engine world, you end up with what looks like powdered corn in, in uh, places that you don't want it. So I run 100% gasoline. Um, I run it at 87. Uh, here in Florida, it costs me, uh, I believe it's about $3.45 a gallon. It's, uh, it's a price to pay to avoid having to... Um, you know, break these engines down and tear carburetors apart or order new carburetor parts. That's still a good deal. I'm running 450 a gallon with corn in it. Well, <laughs> and that's that's one of those things that you get, you know, going across the border. All the more reason you should come on down here to Florida and join us permanently. But, well, you know, that's just one of those things. But these are the basic breakdowns of the rotary. Um, I challenge you to do your research. It's a very interesting little engine. Uh, like Doc said, he got to hear one run. There's a lot of characteristics of the rotary engine that you cannot get in anything else. Once you have a um, have a mindset for the sound, you, it's unmistakable. You can't get it. Um, that goes into exhaust and intake overlap. That's a whole other story for another day. Um, it sounds like a very seriously pissed off bumblebee. So if I can just backtrack for a second and throw out a question, obviously I already know the answer, but for the viewers, you know, we've already seen a couple of comparisons with a piston two-stroke and a piston ported two-stroke specifically. So I'm going to pose the same question that I posed to you in private, and that is, is you know, much like a piston ported two-stroke, you've got the ports here. Is there any benefit to porting these, altering the size or shape of the ports? Yes, definitely. So altering the size and the shape of the ports, as anybody knows, uh, with a cam swap, with porting and polishing, you know, valves, uh, or heads, so to speak, you know, changing your valves, going bigger, smaller valves, valve travel, so on and so forth. This is the same concept. So, going to a bigger exhaust port, naturally you can get more out the, and uh, more efficiently. Going to a bigger intake port, we have uh, several different ports. The most common port is the stock port, obviously, how Mazda sent it from the factory. We have the street port, where we simply go into the port here, and I'll break this apart again so we can kind of see into that stock port that Mazda has made and simply polishing it, taking uh, probably an eighth inch of material in total or off around the entire port. That's a street port. We call it a street port because it makes it more streetable use for everyday driving. Then you go into a bridge port. Simply a bridge port is where you come in, you open this port up, the stock port, and then you put a bridge in place. The bridge is called a bridge simply because the corner seal of the rotor has to travel across the bridge too much or too little, too little you get no benefits from it too much, the corner seal will simply fall out into the port and you have destroyed your engine. That's no damn good. Right. Then from there you can take these ports and completely seal these ports and you go into something called a peripheral port. A peripheral port simply means that we take the housing, we punch out this here little hole, and we put a plug in. Your intake simply sits here. These are now fuel inlets and the peripheral port it matches equally to uh, exhaust and intake. So you, some of you have seen the 24-hour Le Mans know the Mazda 787B that is a peripheral ported four-rotor engine. Um, it is made to run 10,000 RPMs all day long every day as long as it maintains lubrication. So getting into the peripheral port 
and the bridge port. These are non-streetable ports. Uh, the characteristics of the car, it enjoys high RPMs. It's not good for everyday stop and go driving. It's rough on the clutch foot. Um, it can be rough on the clutch itself. Uh, there's a lot of variables that go into it. Most of us guys running around in the rotaries and the, the streetable rotaries and our everyday driver rotaries, you know, we tend to stick with something below the bridge port um, being, you know, whether it be a heavy or mild street port. Again, the street port is simply just peeling material off the mild, you know, is a good little polish. Medium street ports, you know, taking out material, opening it up just a little bit. Also doing thing, the same thing to the exhaust port. You can do this by hand on the exhaust port or the exhaust port you can buy press in uh, pre-manufactured ports to open that up then simply come into the inside of the housing and open up the port that is uh, cast into the housing itself. So continuing with the two-stroke theory, just a couple more quick questions before we wrap this sucker up. First off, you were saying that these kind of exhibit a two-stroke like power band. Uh, you want to expand that? Yes, exactly. Bit? So the rotary engine, you know, so, you know, a lot of us can jump into our five-speed cars. Uh, getting into your five-speed car, you know, you get your, your engine RPM up just a hair, you ease off the clutch, you, you let the clutch come to full engagement, and you begin to accelerate. The rotary engine doesn't like that. Anything below, I'd say, 2,000 RPMs, it's going to spit and sputter, and you're going to feel every bit of the exhaust and intake overlap. So 3,500 RPMs is what we call our launching speed. We make a bunch of noise, uh, we get the car going, you can cruise. But uh, as I was telling Doc here, when you get into the car from the 2,500 RPM to the 4,500 RPM mark, it's uh, somewhat sluggish. I'd compare it to your uh, maybe your average four-cylinder Toyota Corolla. Anything past that at uh, full throttle, it's almost as if you're introducing boost. It, it has a power band on it that just continues to pull to, in my particular case on my car, to that 10,000 RPM mark. It, it, it's a pull like no other. Now we're talking factory bone stock car, you know, pushing maybe 100, 110 uh, horsepower. That doesn't sound impressive. Doesn't sound impressive, but when you have a 2800, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a t uh, 2000 RPM, or a Want a beer? <laughs> Hold on. When you have a 2000 pound car, 110 horsepower, uh, with a 50-50 weight distribution front to rear, it's absolute fun. It's incredible fun. Uh, getting horsepower out of these is very simple. Um, going from the 110 or 100 to 110 horsepower factory mark to maybe the 150 horsepower mark is very cheap, uh, very easy. Uh, once you start doing those things and making those movements, uh, you know a lot of people don't realize what 25 to 30 to 40 horsepower can do for somebody. So yes, that power band is very noticeable. It is uh, very much like a two-stroke. You know, it, it has all the characteristics of a two-stroke. Oil and fuel are always mixing. Uh, the um, exhaust and intake overlap is that of a, of a two-stroke. It's piston ported, it's, it, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's everything is, has the characteristics of a two-stroke. So again, like us rotary guys say, this is our four-stroke, two-stroke. Uh, we put oil into a pan just like you do. We fill our oil the same way you do. We check the oil the same way you do. Thus, they have more experience and uh, want longevity out of our motors. The, the only thing different that we do is uh, is add that premix, and that premix is just great for startups and protecting the apex seals. All right. Well, I'm intrigued. You guys know that I like unique engines, and I'm going to start keeping my eyes out because I need something like this to play with and experiment with and figure it out and learn more myself. Randy, I want to thank you for taking the time to show me this stuff. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Not a problem. And your hospitality. You're a good man. Thank you. Absolutely. Anytime y'all come back and see us. Any of you in the group, you ever in downtown beautiful Pensacola, come see us. Going. Oh, I heard the beep. So don't grope me on camera. Don't grope behind the camera? Don't grope me on camera. Grope me off camera. Off camera. Off camera. Off camera grope. I'm probably going to buzz that into the outtake reel at the end. <laughs>